Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Barr, Executive Director of Nevada Humanities, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you here today for a very special event with the two authors, Kendra Atliwerk and Amy Nizukumatatil, who have written the book selected as Nevada Humanities 2021 Nevada Reads Book Selections. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we gather in our homes throughout Nevada and beyond on the traditional lands of the Paiute, Shoshone, and Washoe people past and present, and to honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls on us to commit to being better stewards of this land as well. And this is particularly poignant on Earth Day today, as we're all asked to reflect about our individual and collective roles in taking care of our planet and combating climate change. This work often begins with cultivating our many senses of nature and a close awareness of the places that we inhabit and explore. And I know all of us love to explore Nevada as much as we can. And as I think we will hear a great deal about this and about our region during this program today. So thank you for being here. I would also like to thank our partners who've helped us make this program possible and also a truly statewide event throughout Nevada. Our Nevada Center for the Book Partners, the Nevada State Library Archives and Public Records Division and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and also the City of Reno Arts and Culture Commission for supporting this project and also of course the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support. This event is also part of Why It Matters in Nevada, an ongoing program that explores and encourages civic participation and which is supported by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. To begin today, I'd like to introduce Gail Brandeis, our moderator for our program, and Gail will then introduce our two authors. Gail Brandeis is a writer and the author of several novels, including Many Restless Concerns, which was written in poetic verse, Delta Girls, the Book of Dead Birds, which won the Bellwether Prize for Fiction of Social Engagement, and My Life with the Lincolns, which was chosen as a statewide read in Wisconsin. Gail has also written a poetry collection titled The Selfless Bliss of the Body, a memoir titled The Art of Misdiagnosis, which is a fabulous title, and the craft book Fruit Flesh, Seeds of Inspiration for Women Who Write. Her poetry, essays, and short fiction have been widely published in places such as The Guardian, The New York Times, The Washington Post, O, The Oprah Magazine, and more. Her works have received numerous honors, including a Barbara Mandingo Kelly Peace Poetry Award, notable essays in Best American Essays several times, the QPB Story Magazine Short Story Award, and the 2018 Multi-Genre Maverick Writer Award. She now teaches at Antioch University and Sierra Nevada University in Incline Village. Gail, thank you so much for being willing to shepherd us through the program today. I'm gonna to hand this over to you. Thank you so much, Christina. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm so delighted to be here for this special Earth Day conversation with two absolutely brilliant writers, Kendra Atliwerk and Amy Nazuk Matatil. Kendra Atliwerk was born and raised on the dry edge of California at the eastern base of the Sierra Nevada mountains. She moved away for a decade, mostly spent being homesick and researching the place she left behind, the product of which is Miracle Country, which just recently won the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award. Congratulations, Kendra, and is just a profoundly gorgeous book. She's the recipient of the Ellen Malloy Desert Writers Award and was selected for the Best American Essays, edited by Ariel Levy. She received her MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Minnesota and now lives in her hometown of Bishop, California. Welcome, Kendra. We also have the amazing Emmy, <laughs> Emmy, Amy <laughs> Nizikmatatil, the author of the New York Times bestselling and utterly entrancing collection of illustrated nature essays, World of Wonders, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments. Finalist for the Kirkus Prize in Nonfiction and named Book of the Year by Barnes and Noble, who also crafted items on their store cafe menu based on the book, which is so cool. She's also published four award-winning poetry collections. And I have to say, I've been a huge fan of her work since her very first glorious collection, Miracle Fruit. Other awards for her writing include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, Mississippi Arts Council, Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Award for Poetry and the National Endowment of the Arts. 
Her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, ESPN, and twice in Best American Poetry. She is professor of English and creative writing in the University of Mississippi's MFA program. Welcome, Kendra and Amy. I'm so, so excited to speak with you both today about your gorgeous work, which is so perfect for Earth Day. And I thought we should get started by getting a little taste of your work. And um, I think we'll start with Kendra. And before Kendra reads, I should mention that the passage she's going to share with us comes after she talks a bit about her father's map company, Sierra Maps, through which he, quote, merges his knowledge of the landscape with the technical skills of a, cart of a cartographer. And I can say that Kendra does the same thing, but merging her knowledge of the landscape with her own amazing skills as a writer. So Kendra, please take it away. Thank you, Gail. And thank you so much to Nevada Reads and to Amy. And it's just such a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this is thrilling and it's really nice to virtually meet all of you. So I'm gonna read a little passage here um, about the naming of places through time in my home region. My father's maps show mountains in a flat valley floor. They suggest the crests of the foothills ubiquitous granite, and the pale pinkish, pinkish hunks of igneous rock called Bishop Tuff, sooty with desert varnish, produced during a prehistoric eruption that determined the shape and character of this place. They keep a tourist from succumbing to a poor sense of scale in wild country. Spread on a table or over a lap, my father's map of the Eastern Sierra quilts together wilderness, national park, national forest. At the northeastern corner, black dashes form the state line, dividing Esmeralda and Mono counties, where the boundary peak wilderness of Nevada gives way to the white mountain wilderness of California. Near this border lies Mono Lake, Pooha and Neget Islands afloat in the big blue round. The names of the streams and peaks call to be arranged into, into stanzas full of rhyme and alliteration. Sand Canyon, Cardinal Pinnacle, Cottonwood Creek, Blind Springs Hill, Sherwin Crest, Round Valley, Onion Valley, Bear Creek Spire, Mount Star. There are first names for these places too. The Owens Valley Paiute spoke a dialect used nowhere else in the country. Say it Paiute and know that these are the people indigenous to this valley who first called themselves Numu. They named Mount Tom Winuba. Many still call Owens Valley Paiahunadu, the land of flowing water. Places we know well get nicknames. There's Robert Ridge, where Pop's hot air balloon snagged in pines, the basket swinging over the ground, and he toted a passenger, an 85-year-old woman with a pacemaker, down a steep pumicey slope. She weighed 80 pounds, he remembers, and I just carried her on my back like a backpack. She said it was the most excitement she'd had in 20 years. There's Mount Dave after Pop's hot air balloon partner, where snowmobilers toss old helmets into a dead tree and Will's Peak, nicknamed after a Swall Meadows neighbor killed in an avalanche. Up a canyon to the north, he calls a meadow after mom. Thank you so much, Kendra, so beautiful. And now Amy, if you could please read from World of Wonders. Thank you, Kendra, that was so gorgeous. Um, and just another plug, if you don't already have Marifel Country, you've got to get it. This has just been my companion through this. Um, I know it's National Poetry Month um, and I should be reading more poetry, uh, but this has just been, I've just been so entranced with this um, and it's the perfect kind of um, balm um, for Earth Day and beyond as well. It's the kind of book that makes you feel like you're traveling without ever leaving your chair. So um, I'm gonna read just the, towards the end of World of Wonders. And this is uh, the only chapter where I devoted, um, uh, this is the only part of the book where I devoted two chapters because I had a lot to say and I, I don't think I'm even finished now about something called the fireflies. And, um, I know some people call them lightning bugs, that kind of thing, but this is um, on the fireflies. So it, it, there's a chapter earlier in the book about fireflies, and this is um, the second version of um, kind of like an epilogue almost. 
What is lost when you grow up not knowing the names for different varieties of fireflies? When you don't have these words ready to pop on your tongue, shadow ghost, sidewinder, the Florida Sprite, Mr. Mac, Little Gray, Murky Flash Train, the Texas Tinies, the Single Snappy, the Tree Chop, just Tree Top Flashers, a July Comet, the Tropic Traveler, Christmas Lights, a Slow Blue, a Tiny Lucy, the Mischievous Marsh Imp, the Sneaky Elves, and in a tie for my personal favorite, the Heebie Jeebies and the Wiggle Dancers. All these names silent with still thousands and thousands more silences following as fireflies hatch, wiggle through their larval, larval stage, pupate, crack out of their shell, and then winged decide not to flash their chartreuse light. Scientists still don't know how, when, or why fireflies decide to stay visually silent. And even through a field of tall grass, in our, sorry, and even though a field of tall grass might be teeming with fireflies, the space and time between flashes have grown longer over the years. There are still wren songs to marvel over. I still need to learn the names of the native insects that will be discovered in the next year alone and the next after that, and the next. Where does one start to take care of these living things amid the dire and daily news of climate change and reports of another animal or plant vanishing from the planet? How can one even imagine us getting back to a place where we know the names of the trees we walk by every single day? A place where a bird Navigating a dewy meadow is transformed into something more specific, something we can hold on to by feeling its name on our tongues, brown thrasher. Or that big tree over there, catalpa. Maybe what we can do when we feel overwhelmed is to start small. Start with what we have loved as kids and see where that leads us. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Amy. What a treat to hear your work in both of your voices. And I agree with Amy, just but I want to include Amy's book that both of your books are so perfect for Earth Day and any day that you want to feel a connection to both glorious, unique voices and this beautiful beleaguered earth. Um, I think both of these books celebrate this planet in such powerful ways. And I chose these two passages for you to read because I love the litany of specific names that you both share, the poetry of those names, the, you know, the delight of those names. And I would love to hear from both of you about why, why it is so important to know the names of our world. And Amy, you touched upon that a bit in what you just read, but I'd love to hear both of your thoughts about why we should know this world by name and how that fits into environmental literacy. Kendra, since I just read, do you want to tackle that one first? Yeah. I Otherwise, I have a ready answer. So go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just pondering. I was thinking about how I love that passage that you read, Amy, and I, I, I adored your book. And I feel like it didn't occur to me the first time I read it. But when you just now said that, that start small, start with the things that we have loved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I felt like it was sort of answering that call that led. It's clearly what led you to write your book. And I feel like it's also what led me to write my book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that definitely comes back around to the names of things. I knew the names of things where I grew up, but I didn't know their stories. And I also grew up in a tourist town where many, many visitors came, didn't know the names of things, didn't know the first true names of things or even the current names of things. And some of them really made an effort to learn that and others didn't. Yeah. And I think it was sort of a, a desire to have a deeper knowledge of a place um, that, that led me to write Miracle Country. So I, I think learning the name of something is sort of learning to see it. I think about the octopus passage in World of Wonders, which was like brought me to tears. There's this moment where you say 
that an octopus, you've never felt so seen and known um, by another creature in your life. And I thought that was incredibly moving. And I think when it comes to names and naming and knowing names, knowing names is knowing stories. And it's a way of showing respect back to a place or another living thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I just, that's so beautiful, Kendra, what you said. And um, I, I guess I would just co-sign everything that Kendra said so, so eloquently. I think maybe one thing I would just add to that is that you know, we see it, I'm not saying anything new about the importance of names, um, but we see what happens when people disregard names um, and how that extends on to humans, you know, um, as recent as, you know, this most recent election, there was definitely people who were purposely uh, mispronouncing Kamala Harris's name and making fun of someone's name um, disregarding how it should be pronounced. It might seem, you know, if you've never been in a situation where that uh, is important to you, that's great. But I'm hoping to appeal to the humanity of people saying that your name is everything because it's, it's, it's your claim, your stake as a, as a community member on this planet. And when you disregard and make fun of things that you don't know, um, we see it in um, events as recent as um, the Atlanta murders that happened um, last month of, you know, having Asian American women murdered because they're disposable, you know, um, they're disposable and there's a kind of, there's a lack of humanizing people because it's, oh, it's just the, the Asian women there. Even when the names were first released, there was, um, people weren't getting the names correct, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, and we see that, you know, if you see a patch of forest and you realize that, oh, it's not just that there's birds there or there's yellow birds there, but that there's hooded warblers and they look like they're wearing a ski mask. Um, and they're not just in the trees, but maybe they're in cottonwoods and in, summertime, it looks like it's snowing when the cottonwoods are in full bloom. Maybe, just maybe, because you know the names of these things, you feel a little bit more tender towards them. And, you know, Rachel Carson says, the more we get to know about the wonderments and, and the animals and plants on, the, um, on this planet, the less appetite we have for destruction. And I think that's so true. Like, it's, it's harder, I think, to want to have violence on a group of people or on a group of um, turtles if you don't know their names because they're disposable, they become disposable. Um, so I think, I think it's very much connected and very much important that we have respect and we have at least a, just human decency. It shouldn't be like a, a left thing, a right thing. It should be a human thing to want to get to know what else we're sharing this planet um, with, you know, the, the names of what we're sharing this planet with. Um, so, yeah. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you both. And Amy, I so apologize for mispronouncing your first name oh, no. um, at the beginning. I know you know it. It's the people yeah. who are like, um, let me see, I'm just going to call you Annie because my roommate was named Annie and you remind me of Annie. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, yeah, I feel awful about my slip of the tongue. And yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. Yeah, and I love how how you that quote from Rachel Carson and you know the talk about learning the names of our world so we can appreciate them, honor them, protect them. And both of you grew up with parents who really instilled a respect for the natural world and a love for the natural world. I know both of you had fathers who took you on hikes. In Kendra's case, sometimes some pretty intense ones. <laughs> and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts for those who have children in their lives. Um, what are the best ways to bring a love for nature and uh, the naming of the natural world, environmental literacy. Um, how do we do that for, for the young people in our lives and, and maybe not so young people as well? Amy, as a parent, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle this one? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I would say to, you know, and, and this was apparent to me even, this was um, clear to me, 
even before I became a parent, I, you know, national, April is National Poetry Month. So in the before times, I would often visit schools, uh, elementary schools and, um, you know, be the guest poet for the day or something like that. And this is back when I thought I'm never getting married, I'm never having kids. But one thing that just always, uh, delighted me to no end is that you almost kind of don't have to teach wonderment or the appreciation of nature to kids. They just, they kind of have it. In fact, it's very rare to ever encounter like a grumpy kid. He's like, nah, I don't want to stomp in a puddle or I don't want to climb a tree, you know, that kind of thing. They're hungry for it already. And you don't have to ever tell a kid to say, you know, look, look, or to exclaim, have one, you know, um, to, to have astonishment over something outside. I think the best thing that we can do is to kind of let them have that time. You know, it's, it sounds kind of the basic, you know, but I mentioned this in the book. Um, not that long ago, there was a, there was a class of um, let's say fifth graders um, where I was talking about um, different bugs and this was in the firefly chapter and the majority of the students thought I was just simply making up fireflies they, and you know and I had to show them a video on YouTube and they were even like nah nah that's CGI you know that's special effect there's no bug that lights up you know I could not believe I thought I was getting punked um, and these are not kids who don't have access to fireflies these were kids in a town where I know there is an abundance of fireflies in the summers but they're just not outside they are watching TV or on the screen. And I'm not anti-screen. I love social media. I, you know, computers are our friends mostly, but there's something to be said for like the amount I'm seeing it all across, even with my, I have a 13 year old and a 10 year old. Um, the amount of indoor time is decreasing year after year that the average like middle schooler has. I mean, and I know we're in a different time and, and things and maybe um, Kendra, you can back me up on this, but uh, I, it's not like my parents were doing something purposeful where they said, you know, the, the quickest thing that would make me roll my eyes is if my parents said, Amy, we are gonna learn about minerals today. Let's go on a hike. That would be the kiss of death. I'd immediately be like, dad, no, you know. Um, but they just got big, you know, sometimes I grumbled, but they just got me outside and they let me kind of do the exploring and kind of gave me the, just a little bit of a push and I did the rest, you know, but just, I think like you have to lead them to, to the outdoors and provide maybe, you know, and I also realize that this is a privilege. I know many of my friends don't feel comfortable being outside that they don't have access. So what I would say is to people, you know, um, who are parents or maybe who aren't parents is like, if you do have access to um, like a neighbor or um, a, a niece or a nephew, um, what are you doing to help encourage their, to just encourage their love of the outdoors? You know, again, you don't have to do too much. Kids will do it kind of on their own. But if you say, okay, hey, just for half an hour, let's put away our phones, take out your earbuds, you know, um, and just, look and see what you're noticing, um, I think you'll be surprised. But you could start small. You don't have to know the names of everything in the field guide books of like all the birds that are around, but could you identify two birds that live five miles around you? You know, that's something that a sixth grader can do, you know, um, so start small. And I think it, it'll be contagious. Yeah, I think I, I echo all of that. Um, I don't have kids, but of my own childhood, I recall very much just getting chucked outside. And I think that was all it took. And not only was I not in the way, I mean, I was lucky. I lived in a place where I could be safely outside. So that's, that's a little complicated, but I have a good friend. She's a writer. She lives in Minneapolis. Her, her three little sons, they are pretty much always in the backyard. And even though it's a small backyard, they there's an entire world out there for them to find insects. And now they're, and they're fascinated with their immediate nature. And then that gets them interested in um, things that they haven't seen yet. So now her sons, I went and saw a rattlesnake nest recently and I told her and her sons are just, they're like, we want to go see rattlesnakes now, even though they live in Minneapolis. So I think it's sort of, it's kind of a snowball effect where they, they, they can see what's available to them, even if that's some ants. I mean, who doesn't remember staring at ants for long periods of time as a child. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Like I remember the, the chorus that I hear, it's like, oh, I'm becoming my mom again. And, you know, she would always say um, in her beautiful Filipino accent, like only boring people are bored. <laughs> you know? And so like, I, I've had to break that phrase out to my, to my own kids once in a while when they're complaining, like, ah, oh, you know, I mean, we're in a pandemic. So, but, and we have a smaller backyard, but there's a whole world out there, just like what you said, Kendra. And I remember, I mean, it sounds so sad and in some ways, and when I go and talk to high schoolers, they look at me with almost like pity and like, what happened, you know? But I said, like, if we had a plastic cup for water and a stick and we found like, we just kept digging until we found mud or made mud, we would paint on the sidewalk. And they were just like, did you have a Nerf gun or, or something? And, I, and it's not like my, I guess my parents just, I don't know, maybe the, in some ways the best thing, my mom is a doctor, you know, we could have had those things, but I think in some ways the best things that they did to cultivate my interior mind was to give me nothing in, in terms of like, they did not give me like, here's a set on how to, you know, like, here's like, I see these, curated things like here's a box on exploring the outdoors here's a microscope here's a you know things like that here's an apron no we I quite literally had like an old foam styrofoam cup a stick and that occupied our whole afternoon and heaven forbid if an ant came nearby I mean we were always kind but that would like that would be the drama of the day it sounds so quaint I realize this sounds ridiculous but whole afternoons were spent um being enthralled, enthralled with mud, water, and ants, and a line of ants, you know. Um, that doesn't sound know. ridiculous at all. That resonates oh. <laughs> with my own childhood, and that time yeah. just spent kneeling on the ground and just seeing the worlds that were, you know, within those blades of grass. Yes, I remember there was like one bully down the street. Of course, he was a bully. He had somehow a micro, he did, was one of us who had a micro, uh, magnifying glass. And he'd be like, Amy, you know, he'd call all the girls over and be like, watch this. And then he'd burn and light ants on fire. And that would be like, that would hold us over, that drama would hold us over for the whole month, you know? Um, not that I'm encouraging that, but I'm just thinking like, there was so much, I never felt bored with just being outside and I had a bike and that was it. That was the outdoor, um, uh, you know, tool I had was just a bike, essentially. It sounds like we had very similar childhoods. I remember the exact same line, like only boring people are bored. Yeah. Um, and I had a pocket knife and that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to have had you in my gang. Yeah. So yeah. free with your pocket knife. No bike for you because the ground was about this steep. Oh um, gosh. <laughs> there is a pocket knife. Go, go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So both of you do such a beautiful job of balancing, you know, the splendor and wonder of the natural world with raising awareness of the human impact upon it, whether it's through, you know, water grabbing or species extinction or just other effects of climate change. And I wonder if you could each talk a bit about how you found that balance between, you know, the wonder and, and raising awareness about the human impact and perhaps um yeah just some thoughts about about why you wanted to include both in your work yeah you know um just real quick and I'll, I'll turn over to Kendra um I, I have an easy answer for that is I know there were so many books that I loved John Weir um uh Annie Dillard uh, uh more Rachel Carson um I mean, all, all the grades, Thoreau. I know the which ones, uh, Edward Abbey, you know, um, kind of the classics of environmental literature. I also knew what parts of which books spoke to me the most. And coincidentally, this is just me. This is not prescriptive for how everybody should do it. I'm not a scientist, but I know the places that I stood up at attention and want and felt like, felt the passion, felt uh, like I wanted to do something is when, each of those writers spoke of something that they loved um, and not about what you should do. There was no, like the finger wagging parts were the parts that immediately was like, oh, just hang on a minute. I'm just, you know, sitting here in Ohio. I'm not doing this, you know? Um, 
And so for some people, those books are absolutely necessary and crucial and science-based and stuff. That's just not kind of not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was um, put this book by an Asian American woman out there that, um, that didn't shy away from, from um, endangered animals and effects of humans um, on land, but I just simply didn't see a whole lot of people that looked like me outside. So I just want, that was kind of more of the statement I wanted to make is that of just saying, hey, here's an Asian American who loves makeup and the music of the eighties and also cares about the environment that you don't have to be one or the other, um, that you can be a mother if you choose. Um, and, and also, heaven forbid, want to spend time with your kids and also love the outdoors. I just didn't see a whole lot of that. So it was kind of, it started from a place of love, but then it went quickly to what haven't I seen about the outdoors? And um, I didn't really have to try too hard because it's kind of, it's just my stories, you know, it's, it's my stories and what I love. So it wasn't like, hmm, let me write about an armadillo now because I haven't read about an armadillo. It just was something like, I started with plants and animals that I love and I wanted to showcase as Walt well Whitman says, do I contain multitudes? Very well, I contain multitudes. That I could be a, um, a person who has crushes, someone who um, loves their parents and um, also loves uh, Madonna or old, older Madonna, <laughs> yeah, or younger Madonna, I should say. And um, someone who loves the 80s music, you know, that kind of thing that you didn't have to be put in a box. Um, Kendra, how about you? Yeah, I felt like, well, I felt like reading Amy's book when I read World of Wonders, it felt like the environmental side of it did come very organically from you and from your story. And it didn't kind of give me that, oh, like, I want to not do what, you know, when, when someone tells you what to do, at least me, I automatically want to not do that, even if I would agree with that normally and I didn't so I felt like when it comes like organically from you and from your story or the story you want to tell then you can escape that so I felt like you accomplished that and I tried to do the same in Miracle Country by really I was just writing stuff as I was learning it so I wasn't really off the hook myself so I was learning about aspects of history I was learning about um aspects of the way water and land has been has been taken by different groups throughout history in my area. And I was basically walking the reader through the experience of learning that stuff with me. Mm -hmm. And then I think that that would all, first of all, I was actually learning it while I was writing because I was doing research while I was writing the book. And then I also hope that that makes more of a curious experience and more of a learning experience than a sort of like, let's be ashamed now. And yeah. because if you, if you, when I was in college, I had this little, uh, I had this little anarchist planner that would tell like radical revolutionary events across the world that had happened on each day of history. And it said in the back, it had this miniature essay called Beyond Doom. And the, that essay was very inspiring to me, especially at that age, because the, the basic argument was as soon as you um, essentially accept defeat, then you have lost at that moment. So I think if we sort of sit back and, and focus on shame and focus on everything we have lost, which is considerable, well, that's when we seed. That's when we seed the struggle. So to me, it's important to learn and be curious um, more, more than it is to sort of, sort of sit around and, and feel bad about things that, that we've done to the planet. Yeah, I love that, Kendra. And that, that actually encapsulates the feeling I had when I was reading your book is that it was such a discovery for me and that was very palpable and that learning felt contagious and, um, and enthusiastic. I was learning so much about the land um, from reading your book and it felt very much like, uh, like a friend was guiding me through. Not like, look at me, I'm the water expert now, you know, that kind of thing and, and making me feel terrible about what I didn't know. It was more like, oh wow, I'm actually on the journey with you. And I so appreciate that. And I think there was a lot of, frankly, um, older male written books about the outdoors that I think did not have that welcoming kind of experience um, that was all too happy to showcase what they knew and how, how sad for the reader who does not know this, you know, that kind of thing. And that, it's just off-putting, you know? I mean, I still read them and, 
and was hungry for it. But I just, I think what your book does so beautifully is that it opens up the conversation rather than shuts people down and shames them. It doesn't shame them, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and I love what you said too, just, just to follow up, you know, um, that's when we seed, like when we say, okay, we can't do anything anymore. Margaret Atwood, I, you know, one of the great things about being in a Zoom situation and being, you know, is that you can attend these events. And I, I was in the audience for a Margaret Atwood talk. And she said, you know, someone asked like, how can you write um, when, when basically everything is going to, to the heck in a handbasket, you know, that kind of thing. And she's, she just, you know, looked very wise. And she said, you know, the future has not yet been written we still can rewrite the future, you know, uh, or not rewrite, we could, we're still writing the future. And I just thought that was so profound. And I was like, of course, yeah. Like, why would we just lay down now and say like, well, there's nothing, we had a nice run, Earth. Thanks for hosting, you know. Um, I don't know, it was just in one sentence that she said like, the future has not yet been written. I, so I, I love that what you were saying, Kendra, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, I, I really agree with what you said, Amy, I feel that way about both of your books that both sparked so much curiosity. Mm -hmm. I loved um, just all the little bits of knowledge about the land and the animals that I, I found in both of your books, and they were both so welcoming. I felt so invited on you know, these, these really deep, glorious journeys. And it made me want to learn even more about wow, the place where I live and, you know, the, the plants and animals, which I've been trying to learn about and learn the Washoe names for. And you, you both inspired me to want to dig even more deeply. And I'm so grateful for that invitation, for that space you opened through your own curiosity and deep explorations of the world, which, which are just so glorious. And um, one thing that I love about both of your work too, is you both write about home in a really powerful way. Um, you know, Kendra, you moved back to the home where you grew up in the Bishop area. And Amy, you found a new place that spoke home to you and your family in Mississippi. And Kendra asks a question in her book that I thought was really evocative, and I thought maybe you could both talk about it a little bit, where she asks, in what sense do we make our homes, and in what sense do our homes make us? And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that and what it means for both of you to write about home. Do you want to start with this one first, Kendra? Go for it, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I might be unusual in that I, in what sense do our homes make us? So my book, um, it tells the story of my home place, but also my family's life here. So um, just my immediate family, not like my genealogy, but my parents met in this strange mountain community, uh, high desert mountain area. And they met here, they were both just sort of like outdoor people, I guess um, they were, and they, my dad was a pilot, my mom was a school teacher. And so they, they raised us to, I grew up halfway up a mountain. There was one other kid in the neighborhood, you know, I was 30 minutes from a town <laughs> and, and they raised us to have that be normal. And so I think in my case, I have no idea who I would even be if I hadn't grown up where I grew up. Um, I, I, I would be a completely different person. I definitely wouldn't have written this book. Um, so in that sense, I feel entirely shaped by my, by my home. Um, but I think it's really, really inspiring to read a book like World of Wonders where you have so many different homes throughout this book and each one you're able to be head over heels for in a different way in some aspect. And also that, that, that idea of showing up to an entirely new place and feeling like that's home. That to me is totally, un I've never experienced that because I've got this place so much under my skin. And that was such a fascinating idea. Um, and, and one that I think is really important if we can think, if we can sort of expand the notion of home or even, even think of, I think it's important to think of yourself as living in a place. And especially this past year, it might feel sometimes like we are living in virtual spaces more than we're living in a place, more than we're living in a community with 
there's ground, there's, there's the, yeah, there's air outside. It sometimes feels like culturally that gets lost in the shuffle, especially when for people who work largely on the computer. So I think the idea of, of home shaping us is something that we should cultivate no matter where that home is for better or for worse, I think. And, and I tried when I was living it. So in my book, I go to Los Angeles, I go to Minneapolis and in each of those places, I did feel very much like those places were also shaping me, but they were also shaping me in the sense that they were, they were putting pressure on this notion of where I had come from and where I had left behind. And without having left it, I would never have had the perspective that I have on it now. So, so I think putting places that are important to us in conversation with each other, kind of through different eras in our lives can also be a really important way to just think about the relationship of our lives to place. Because if human beings have existed with this relationship to place through all of history, and I feel like that can sometimes get lost a little bit now, but technology has become such a big part of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm, I almost just want to sit with your words for a little bit here. Um, I guess maybe one thing I'll add to that is just um, what I think was really helpful. I've never been able to articulate it in poems. I think one of the central um, questions that I've had in all of my um, poetry is, is this notion for what is home? What does home mean? And for, um, the child of immigrants, I think that is a even more loaded question because at the one hand, of course, I'm home. I was born in um, Chicago and yet I've had people, random strangers, you know, yell out to me, um, not a cat call, but like go back to where you came from. And so the sassy part of me is like, what do you mean Chicago? You know, <laughs> like, um, or, you know, like, uh, or Western New York, you know, like that kind of thing. But the one, and I, and I saw it also, I can joke about it. It's lighthearted to me, even though it annoys the bejeebies out of me. What I can't abide is when I see people, and I've witnessed that throughout my whole life, say that to my parents, who've now been in this country that they love so much. Um, and they are Republicans, which is a whole nother story because usually the people who shout these things to them are Anyway, I can't, I, I, I didn't want to go on to the whole thing, but, you know, for example, after 9-11, my Republican father had a full can of Diet Pepsi thrown at his head at full force from a pickup truck in the parking lot of a Walmart, and it, oh, excuse me, um, that was my dog haiku, um, and he had his head busted open, he had to have stitches, you know, and the next day, his response you know, I was like, dad, don't you see this? Like, what is it? You know, like, this is terrible. And his response was to buy American flag stickers for his car, you know, and it's complex and complicated. And I can't pretend to know, to say like, who am I to say like, that's not the right response, dad, you know, that kind of thing. He loves this country so much. He's helped hundreds upon hundreds of white people and their babies breathe. He was a, um, He's a respiratory, he's retired now, but he was a respiratory therapist. So he helped geriatric folks and Nick, he worked in the NICU unit. So babies who are just struggling um, to breathe, he would leave our, my birthday parties, my tennis matches to go help these emergencies, you know, that kind of thing. So when I think back to what my father has given this country and its inhabitants and how many times he's made to feel like he's not at home, even though America feels like home to him more than India does. He only spent the first 20 years of his life in India. He's 70 something now. So it just, uh, having the essay form, I think, helped me unfettered without line breaks to investigate how then was I able to find home even when I was sticking out like a sore thumb in many places, you know, that kind of thing. And 
that has maybe a gift that I don't think I could ever repay my parents is that they taught me, you know, if you look up, you can see Orion almost wherever you are in the Western hemisphere, you know? So if I move to Iowa or Western Kansas um, or the suburbs of Phoenix um, or Ohio, I can look up and see my friend, my buddy, Orion, you know? Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, so I'll stop there, but just this notion of home, became malleable because it had to be, it, ha it had to be. Um, uh, and now it's something my, my kids have only known two, two homes and now we're here in Oxford, Mississippi, which is a place that to me was sounded always fraught with um, difficult race, racial histories. Uh, and this is the one place that nobody asks me or tells me to go back where I came from or nobody asks me, what are you? So it's really interesting. Even my preconceived notions of what Mississippi is um, really threw me for a loop because this is the one place that I feel so much at home. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, both of you. And I so appreciate how you bring up you know, issues of racism and white supremacy in your books. You know, everything from microaggressions to the displacement and genocide of indigenous people. And I wonder if you could each talk just a little bit about how you see environmental justice and social justice interacting both in your work and in the world. I have a quick short answer to this and then I'll hand it back to, to Kendra. You know, one thing I noticed too, I wanna, I wanna just say that I don't think there's any social justice movement, any climate um, activism that will be successful if we don't get youth on board. And I think they all, all these movements are, have been so energized from the youth. And that's something that actually gives me so much hope is that even though I joke and say a lot of the kids these days don't know what fireflies are, there's also a very loud group of, um, you know, 20 somethings, teens um, and younger who are, um, who, who've kind of been guided to fight for for the planet to um raise their voices when they see injustice in the world um as much as we see like what a horrifying week this has been in terms of um, we just saw um uh a horrific killing in columbus ohio which is one of the homes um that i that i claim um it's the youth in particular that i find so much inspiration from they're not settling, they're not settling. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, oh, other generations have settled. I'm just saying that what's been so inspiring is that these youth will not be silenced. And so I, I just think that any organization that wants to kind of make a change, definitely, I think, do your due, due diligence and make sure you have someone who's in their early 20s there, someone who's a teen in there, because they have a lot to offer. Um, Kendra? Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. I think, you know, despite what I might see as maybe a cultural drift towards dislocation, um, we see words about nature falling out of children's dictionaries. There are a lot of young people who aren't okay with that um, and are trying to push the culture back in the other direction. And as we said earlier, the future isn't written yet. So that's really inspiring, I think. And I think that kind of connects to Gail's question about environmental justice and justice in other areas, it's all, it's all connected. You can't separate it. Um, that's one thing that I love about where I live is when we're, when you're talking about issues of land use and land stewardship and water, everybody's in it together. It, it's, you can't separate those things. They aren't separate. Um, I think sometimes they kind of fall, fall apart and maybe um, people will forget about People will forget the links, but I do think I do think that they're inseparable. Thank you both so much. I want to make sure we leave a bit of time for questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to post it. I did see there was one earlier for Kendra. Um, Denise Quirk asks, um, how would you tell a story to leaders who are becoming afraid there may not be enough water in Lake Mead to power Hoover Dam this summer? And what story would you want the people in Las Vegas, for example, to discuss together? Um, so what story would I tell? 
gosh, um, I guess, I guess I would say, hmm. Um, well, I, I don't know as much about Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam as I do about the water issues in California directly. So I would say, yeah, get reading and dig in and, um, and the stories that you find make you feel like they give you a new perspective on a dam and a water situation that's maybe been part of your life forever. Like the, the, the books and the stories and the narratives that change your perspective on that, then that would be something to bring to light to leaders and to sort of use as conversation starters with community. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people in any given community who do have these concerns. And if you guys can get together, then that can be really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions in the audience? Well, while we're waiting to see if anyone posts other questions, I'd love to hear from both of you about um, what nature writers you've found most inspiring and have given you the most hope um, and joy over the years. And I know some, some names have been mentioned already, but perhaps who are some nature writers who our audience might not have heard of yet? Mm, that's such a good question. You know, um, I would say, one, I want to give um, a shout out to a classic that kind of made me, that was, that was um, at first glance, you would never even, maybe even notice it in some ways, but she absolutely gave me permission to include family in the outdoors, even though she herself is not a mother, but Terry Tempest Williams spoke so lovingly about her own mother um, and, uh, and, and grandmother until I had read her, I had not seen the presence, frankly, of any family members and any narratives of the outdoors. It was always weirdly like John Muir um, hanging out during a rainstorm, climbing trees, and where is his wife and children? You know, that kind of thing. Or Thoreau out by Walden, and his mom is doing his laundry, you know. So I just love and appreciate that. That also kind of was like, yeah, absolutely. For my life, my family is so much a part of my life. So it would be so weird and unnatural for me to not include them. So I would just give um, a shout out to authors like Camille Dungy, who um, writes about um, motherhood in the outdoors so beautifully. Robin Wall Kimmer, who also writes about the outdoors. And I, and I noticed, I was pleased to see you mentioned uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, Kendra, in, in the acknowledgments of your book as well. I just think that that's like writing sweetgrass. If you don't have it already, I feel like everybody has it in some ways, but if you don't, that's just kind of a nice book to have to make you feel like, um, what's the word? I, I want to choose my words carefully on this. Writing sweetgrass is a book that makes you feel alive and that it reminds you of your place in this world, which is not the center of the world. And that's, and rightly so, and rightly so. I'm not that I ever think that I'm the center of the world, but it even for someone um, like me, who is used to pushing other people forward or, you know, being very conscious of the energy I put out there in the world um, also just makes me remember to have a back seat to other living, breathing, uh, and not in a, not in a pejorative way, like um, a guilt making inducing way, you know, it's just, it's such tender book. So that would be my, probably my number one book to recommend. Um, yeah, I'll start, I'll start end with those. Yeah, um, I, I am familiar with and second everybody that Amy has mentioned, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which probably everybody knows already, <laughs> was really important to me in writing this book because it put this this way of thinking about reciprocity in yeah. such simple terms i just it i was like this should be required reading for like every business owner politician just like just this really basic formula of reciprocity that has been so lost in in mm -hmm. dominant american culture i thought that was that she just did a beautiful job of sort of encapsulating that um Another writer who had a book come out in 2020, um, Noe Alvarez, it's called Spirit Run, and it, it's a beautiful nonfiction book um, about a cross-continental run um, by a group of multi-tribal indigenous people. So 
uh, memoir and history and land landscape, a beautiful book about all of those things. Um, and I also really love, as far as desert writing, I really love the writer Ellen Malloy. She has four beautiful books about um, the desert that I just felt, I feel like she has a sort of a connection to place and landscape and especially desert landscapes, which are often sort of discarded as a place to um, d throw away obsolete weapons or do really destructive forms of mining. She just has a really deep connection to desert landscapes. And she's also really funny, which is always appreciated in, in nature writing, which I also enjoyed about Amy's book. So Ellen Malloy is another one. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. And Christiana Shortridge asks, what do you hope Earth Day looks like in 2050, if you have a, a short answer for that? Mm, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I hope we're not all underwater <laughs> um, in some ways. I mean, living here in the South, and I don't mean to be flip about it. I genuinely have some concerns. You know, I, I'm sure most of you saw that map. I was like, please, let's not do this in 2020 when we're already like, for me, I'm already fraught with just worry. They showed that map of like all of Florida sinking in underwater soon. And that terrifies me because again, that's my happy place, my parents' garden in Central Florida. My hope is that um, Earth Day is represented even more so. I think it's come a long way since even the early 90s, you know. Um, I remember it was considered almost radical in the late 80s, 90s to wear a shirt with the planet on it. That was like considered alternative. This, I'm really dating myself here. Some of you, uh, anybody who's tuned in here is like, what? But it really, it truly was. It was considered like, oh, you're on the fringe. <laughs> If you just have a planet, it didn't even have words on it, just a planet on there. Heaven forbid, if you had a peace sign, that was considered, whoa, what are you doing in this age of heavy metal? I would hope that um, Earth Day is still celebrated, but I also hope that it's um, equitable in terms of um, being, that people from all different backgrounds get to celebrate it, Dif different abilities, different, um, of course, different um, cultural backgrounds. Um, different economic backgrounds as well, so that it doesn't become, it doesn't, it doesn't stay stagnant of like, oh, uh, middle to upper middle class get to celebrate it. Everybody else is working their jobs, working for jobs, who has time to actually sit outside and plant a garden. My hope is that Earth Day becomes just more equitable for people. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... I hope, yeah, I hope it's not smoky <laughs> here yeah. in California for it. That's, <laughs> that's the only thing I'll add. <laughs> and I hope that it, it, I hope that it sort of trickles into the rest of the year more and more. Thank you both so much. What a joy it has been to talk with you both about your work and the earth and everything in between. Um, please, everyone, if you have not read these books, I hope you will. If you have read them, reread them because they are full of so much richness. And I'm so grateful for both of your voices. Thank you for being here on this Earth Day and thank you, Nevada Humanities, for hosting us. Yes, thank I you. Wanted I want to join in too and to thank you, Kendra and Amy and Gail for your time with us today. I think one of the pleasures of our Nevada Reads program this year has been working with you guys and a consortium of other people who are just dedicated to Nevada's natural spaces and the natural spaces of the West and beyond. You guys are good people, one and all. So thank you so much for your time today. And I did just want to say a quick reminder that um, I know this has been in the chat already, but we do have many upcoming events related to both of the, your books, to World of Wonders and Miracle Country in the near future and throughout the year. Um, these are the creative workshops that we have going on right now, which are actually quite exciting and they're free. So I really encourage people to sign up for those. They're going to be, they're just wonderful to sort of dabble and delve into <clears throat> the creative side of looking closely uh, at, our, at our natural surroundings. Um, it's very exciting. Um, you can go to nevadahumanities.org for more details to and to register for those programs as well. And as we also mentioned, you can find Kendra and Amy's books for sale at our local Nevada independent bookstores, Sundance Books and Music in Reno, 
on the Writer's Block in Las Vegas, and they both have online retail uh, sales available as well. We have also at Nevada Humanities invested in a collaboration with our libraries across the state to provide digital copies of these books to any Nevadan with a local library card um, on and off throughout the year through OverDrive. So just contact your local library for details uh, in how to access those books as well. And please also visit nevadahumanities.org to sign up for our newsletter and event announcement. We'd love to see you all at future programs. And uh, just thank you all for being here today. And um, I don't have to say travel safely anymore. Just be safe. <laughs> thank, you. thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Gail. It's such a joy.